Well, good morning on this Mother's Day and welcome. And for those of you who are watching us online on our live stream, I know we have about 100 uh, devices logged in. Welcome. We're glad you're worshiping with us as well. And uh, so good to see faces. And so um, glad that you are uh, coming back and uh, that we can worship together in person. You know, in William Shakespeare's play, Julius Caesar, there's a famous scene about betrayal. Um, It's in the third act, as all the Roman senators pull out their knives to assassinate Caesar, the last assassin is Caesar's friend Brutus. And in Shakespeare's telling, Caesar looks at his friend and asks, you too, Brutus? All of us have experienced betrayals in life, situations where someone we trusted broke faith with us. Some betrayals are just annoying, others are life-changing. But if we're honest, we've also done the same thing to people, whether to a friend or to a parent, to a spouse or to a coworker. All of us have broken faith with people in both large and small ways. And as Christians, there have been times in our spiritual journey where we've all broken faith with God. In Shakespeare's portrayal, Caesar responded to to broken faith with surprise. How does God respond when we as his people break faith with him? Well, today we start our summer sermon series, Course Corrections. As, As we seek to live out our lives as the people of God in the world, there are times when we drift off the path that God has for us. And sometimes this happens subtly, like a surfer um, that slowly drifts down the coastline without realizing it from the tide. But other times it happens quickly when, when we make a deliberate choice to step off the path that we know that God has for us. So for the next 12 weeks, we're going to look at how to make course corrections in our lives as God's people when we get off course. And to do this, we're going to be looking at the 12 minor prophets, one each week for the next 12 weeks. Each Sunday, we'll explore the message of one of the minor prophets and then listen to what the Spirit of God may be saying to each of us about any course corrections that we might need to make in our own lives. And today we begin with the first minor prophet, the book of Hosea. A minor prophet that shows us how God responds when we break faith with him in our spiritual journey. So let me give you a quick overview of the minor prophets. The the 12 minor prophets are part of the writing prophets found in the Old Testament part of the Bible. See, the Bible mentions a lot of speaking prophets. Men like Nathan and Elijah and Elisha. Women like Miriam and Deborah and Huldah. And these speaking prophets were very influential among the people of God, but none of them had their words collected, edited, and compiled and put in the Bible. There's no book of Elijah. There's no book of Huldah in the Bible. The the writing prophets are unique because their words were written down and included in the Bible associated with their name. Now, Of the 39 books that are in the Old Testament, 17 of them are writing prophets. Five what are called major prophets and 12 what are called minor prophets. And and major and minor simply refers uh, not to the key, um, but to the length of the books. Major are the longer prophets, books like Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah, and minor are the shorter ones, the ones that we'll be looking at over the next 12 weeks. Each of these books is a collection of various oracles. Now, an oracle back in ancient Israel was a spoken message that a prophet would deliver to the people of God. So it was kind of like a sermon, only most of these oracles were given in the form of poetry. And these oracles were often called the word of the Lord because they carried God's own authority with them. And over time, the oracles that these prophets gave, were written down, collected, edited, and put in books associated with the name of that prophet. And so a book in the Bible might contain dozens of different oracles that were given at different times and to address different circumstances. 
These minor prophets all lived between the 8th century and the 5th century before Jesus was born. And although some of their oracles were about the coming of Jesus, and we'll see some of those in the next 12 weeks, most of what they say refer to events that took place within their own lifetimes. So we begin with Hosea, and uh, let's begin with Hosea chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. It says this, The word of the Lord that came to Hosea, son of Beeri, during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and during the reign of Jeroboam, son of Jehoash, king of Israel. When the Lord began to speak through Hosea, the Lord said to him, Go marry a promiscuous woman and have children with her. For like an adulterous wife, this land is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. So Hosea married Gomer, daughter of Diblium, and she conceived and bore him a son. Hosea was a prophet from the northern kingdom of Israel when Israel was divided into two kingdoms the um, kingdom of Judah in the south and the kingdom of Israel in the north. And from this first verse, um, Bible scholar Elizabeth Actemeyer says, estimates that Hosea's ministry um, lasted nearly 30 years from about 750 B.C. till about 723 B.C. or so. And God gives Hosea a very strange command to marry a promiscuous woman and to start a family with her. Some translations translate verse 2 as prostitute, but the Hebrew word here is, is more vague in general, describing someone who is promiscuous. And it's a strange command. It's a command that you, it's advice that you would never give someone that was looking to get married. But in obedience to this command, Hosea marries a woman also from the north named Gomer. And the book of Hosea chronicles the ups and downs of their marriage. After they got married and had kids, Hosea, uh, the book of Hosea recounts three children. She abandons him to be with other people. Hosea eventually divorces Gomer for breaking her wedding vows, and she sinks further and further into her promiscuity until she becomes utterly captive to it. But then later in the book, also at God's command, Hosea seeks her out, finds her, forgives her, reconciles with her, and they try to rebuild their marriage. Now, there's a lot we don't know about Hosea and Gomer. But what we do know is that their marriage was a prophetic sign that gives us a window into God's relationship with His people, which includes us. As verse 2 says, for like an adulterous wife, this land, the people of this land, the people of God were guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. See, see the book of Hosea is not a marriage manual. It's, it's not a how-to book about how to survive infidelity. Hosea's marriage was a unique prophetic symbol designed to reveal something about God that we would not know otherwise. Hosea's marriage shows us how God responds when we as his people break faith with him in the way Gomer broke faith with Hosea. And the way God's people break faith with God is by devoting themselves to other gods, to idols, to counterfeit gods. You see, God views devotion to idols as cheating, as cheating. Idolatry is to our relationship with God what cheating is to marriage. See, like a marriage, our relationship with God is intended to be exclusive. The, the Bible's word for this is the word covenant, which is why we call marriage, as Christians, we call marriage a covenant relationship. When we trust in Jesus Christ, we enter into a covenant 
relationship with God. And this relationship is exclusive. And so the very first commandment of the Ten Commandments is to have no other gods. And, and the second commandment is to, to not create false images of God, which means to worship God as God actually is, rather than trying to reduce God into what we want God to be. And these first two commandments of the Ten focus on the exclusiveness of our relationship with God. Now, God doesn't want an exclusive relationship because He's insecure or afraid. But God knows that an exclusive relationship is important because when He is first in our lives, everything else will be in order. But when God is not first in our lives, everything else will be out of balance. Now, it's tempting for us to say, well, we don't have idols today. After all, the kind of idolatry that we read about in the book of Hosea and other parts of the Old Testament seem like an ancient artifact of primitive people from the past. We, we certainly don't have those kinds of idols today, not in Glendora, the pride of the foothills, not in the United States, or do we? About a decade ago, a, a pastor named Tim Keller wrote a book called Counterfeit Gods. Look at how Tim Keller defines an idol. He says, what is an idol? It is anything more important to you than God. Anything that absorbs your heart and imagination more than God. Anything you seek to give you what only God can give. Anything so central to your life that should you lose it, your life would hardly feel worth living. See, not all idols are carved out of wood, chiseled out of stone, or forged from metal. An idol is simply any created thing that we are tempted to place in that place in our lives that only our Creator should occupy. An idol is a counterfeit God. And to find this way, our world is filled with idols that are continually clamoring for our devotion. At the risk of getting personal, let me mention a few. Money can be an idol. Not that there's anything wrong with money in and of itself, but an excessive love of money or an obsession to make more and more and more or a compulsion to consume more and more turns money into a counterfeit God. And when money becomes an idol, our lives are consumed by greed and our relationships are poisoned with envy. The ironic thing about the idol of money is that people from every economic strata are tempted by it. Politics can be an idol. When people seek political power above all else, no matter what it costs them, they've turned politics into an idol. When a Christian's commitment <clears throat> to their political party captures their heart and inspires their imagination more than Jesus does and His teachings do, We've turned politics into an idol. A relationship with another person can become an idol. Any created thing that occupies that place in our lives that only our Creator should occupy is an idol, a counterfeit God. <clears throat> in John Calvin's Institutes, he wrote, Human nature is a perpetual factory of idols factory of idols. Something deep within us is continually tempted to take the good gifts God gives and to fashion these good gifts into counterfeit gods that we put first in our lives. It's a continual temptation, both in the Old Testament for the people of God and for the people of God today. The temptation every Christian faces whether they're conscious of it or not. So let me be transparent and tell you about one of my idols. There have been times in my life when being a pastor was a counterfeit God in my life. 
Now, I first heard the call of God to become a pastor when I was 20 years old, um, shortly after I came to Christ during my first year of college. Um, about nine months after I finished seminary, <clears throat> I became the lead pastor at my home church, and I served in that role for about 15 years, and I loved being a pastor. Being a pastor felt like doing what I was made by God to do. But over the course of those 15 years, being a pastor at that church gradually began to take over my identity and become the most important thing in my life. Oh, I would say that God was the most important thing in my life, and I really believed it at the time. But looking back, I can see that I had slowly created an image of God who was only concerned with ministry success and church growth. It's a slow and gradual process. And as it was happening, instead of growing into godly virtues like humility and love, compassion and courage, I found that being a pastor was making me more pride, prideful and angry, judgmental and afraid. And as that church became more and more successful by outward measurements, I neglected my marriage neglected my friendships, neglected my health. And near the end of my 15 years at that church, I could not imagine who I was if I wasn't a pastor. And I held on to that with a death grip, which is what people do with counterfeit gods when they're afraid that they're going to lose them. I had drifted away from God's path by taking a good gift that God had given me and placing that gift in that space in my heart that only God should occupy. I was cheating on God. Let's move on to chapter 2 of Hosea for the next response from God. Chapter 2, verse 6. Therefore I will block her path, that's Israel's path, with thorn bushes. I will wall her in so that she cannot find her way. Because Israel had broken faith with God by chasing counterfeit gods, God says he will respond by blocking her path and walling her in. Now, when Isaiah spoke these words, the nation of Assyria was already gradually taking over more and more of Israel's territory. Until finally, in 732 BC, Israel would in, or, uh, Assyria would invade Israel, take all the people of the northern kingdom captive into exile, and the northern kingdom would cease to exist from that day forward. Assyria's eventual invasion of Israel was a direct consequence of Israel's cheating on God by chasing counterfeit gods. You see, God confronts cheating with consequences. He confronts them with consequences. When God's people break faith with God, it's, a, it's like a domino that falls that causes other dominoes to fall as well. These consequences are often painful and disruptive, like Israel's exile into Assyria. And that's what happened to me with my idol. Because being a pastor had become a counterfeit God in my life, in 2007, God removed it. God loved me too much to let me self-destruct in my devotion to that false God. While I was going through a divorce, a consequence of neglecting my marriage, I also left pastoral ministry and it was hard. It was like detoxing from a narcotic that I'd become addicted to without even realizing it over time. When we break faith with God, there are consequences. But fortunately, it doesn't end there. Skip down to verses 14 through 17 of chapter 2. God says, Therefore, I am now going to allure her. That's allure Israel. I will lead her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. There I will give her back her vineyards and make the valley of Achor a door of hope. There she will respond as in the days of her youth, as in the days she came out of Egypt. In that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband. You will no longer call me my master. I will remove the names of the Baals 
from her lips. No longer will their names be invoked. Here God pictures Israel as taking Israel back into the wilderness, back where Israel's relationship with God began. Centuries earlier, earlier, you can read about it in the book of Exodus, God had saved Israel from their slavery in Egypt and brought them into the wilderness where they became God's covenant people. It was in the wilderness God gave them the Ten Commandments. It was in the wilderness that Israel took vows to put God first, to worship God as God truly is instead of images. It was in the wilderness that Israel agreed to become the people of God, an instrument of blessing to all the other nations of the world. You might think of the wilderness as their wedding venue when they entered into their covenant with God. And now, centuries later, Israel has broken these promises and she is returning to a wilderness-like experience when she goes into exile. And God says that while Israel is in exile, he will woo them back. The valley of Achor will become a door of hope. The name Achor comes from a a Hebrew word for trouble, and you can see this picture of the valley of Achor on the screen. Why? It's a desolate place. It's a place where if you got lost, you'd need search and rescue to come and find you, or you'd die there. The valley of Achor was a word picture of Israel's coming desert experience, their wilderness experience of exile. And God promised to create a door of hope out of that experience. And when that happens, Israel will call God husband instead of master. And once again, we can see that the marriage relationship is the central image for our relationship with God in the book of Hosea. But there's also a word play here because the Hebrew word Baal in verse 17 actually means master or Lord. The the Baals in verse 17 are a reference to the counterfeit gods that Israel was chasing. Israel had begun to project the image of these counterfeit gods onto their God, these false masters. God said he will break that image and they will see him as their husband. Here's the third action God takes when we break faith. God woos us back to himself with his love. He woos us back. Even in the midst of consequences, God woos us back. When I left pastoral ministry in 2007, I entered in one of the most difficult seasons of my life. I was grieving the end of a 23-year marriage. I was trying to build a strong relationship with my kids when they only lived with me half the time. For over a year, I couldn't find a full-time job, and I worked part-time jobs. For over a year, I didn't go to church. Instead, I met with a small group of Christian friends who walked with me. It was my valley of Achor, my wilderness exile. And in that barren place... God began to woo me back to himself with his love. Now that my idol was removed, I could begin to hear God as God truly was. And that season was and is still foundational and formational to who I am today. That barren valley was a door of hope that opened new and deeper ways for me to walk with Jesus. Even in the midst of the consequences of my idolatry, God did not give up on me. Finally, one more passage to look at, skipping ahead to chapter 11 of Hosea, verse 8. God says, How can I give up on you, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, Israel? How can I treat you like Adma? How can I make you like Zeboim, which are two cities God destroyed in Genesis? My heart is changed within me. All my compassion." Is aroused. Here we find God's heart turning towards Israel, that he will forgive his people, just as Hosea forgave his wife and tried to reconcile with her. God welcomes us back with forgiveness. He welcomes us back. 
Just like the father in the parable of the prodigal son welcomed home his son after time of rebellion, God welcomes us back from our captivity to counterfeit gods. Just as Hosea invited Gomer back into their home after their divorce, and they tried again. And, and it's not so much that God changes as much as God's response to us changes when we change. When our hearts are closed and calloused, God responds with consequences. But when our hearts soften and when we forsake our counterfeit gods, God responds with forgiveness. 2007, I believed I would never pastor again, and that was just fine with me. I was starting to see the toll it had taken on me and taken on the people that I cared about in my life. But over a span of about five years after I left pastoral ministry, God began to show me that there might be a way to pastor that was different than what I'd done before. And over those five years, he gently began to lead me back into ministry again, first at a little church plant, then at Lake Avenue Church in Pasadena, and then finally two and a half years ago here at Glenkirk. Today, I hold my calling as a pastor with open hands instead of clenched fists. And I know who I am as God's child, regardless of what I do or the mistakes I make or, or on any given day, how successful or effective or ineffective I might feel. God welcomes us back with forgiveness. So this is Hosea's message, both from his words and from his personal life, that as God's people, we are continually tempted by counterfeit gods that threaten to push God to the margins of our lives. When we become devoted to these counterfeit gods, when they capture our hearts and our imagine, God views it as cheating, as breaking faith. And so out of love, God sends consequences. He woos us back to him. And when we do come back, he forgives us. Hosea's marriage was a visible sign of this. And we don't know how Hosea and Gomer's story ended. Whether happily ever after are filled with more heartache. Which counterfeit gods tempt you the most? I know that's a pretty personal question. But if you were to name your idols, what would they be? I've named one of mine today, although there are more that I've struggled with through the years. And yours probably is not being a pastor, but maybe it's the church or a relationship with someone. Maybe it's one of the big three that Tim Keller talks about in his book, Money, Sex, or Power. Have you become captive to a counterfeit God? Have you created your own image of God to justify your devotion to something other than the God who is revealed through his son, Jesus Christ? Hosea's message to us today is that it's not too late to make a course correction and to come home. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these words, <clears throat> for the message of Hosea, and that you reveal yourself through the painful experiences of his life. God, we want to be your people. We want to put you above all else. Protect us from counterfeit gods. Protect us from making false images of you. Father, for those that are here today that hear your gentle voice wooing them back, soften their hearts that they might respond with faith and find forgiveness. God, we love you. Help us love you with our whole hearts. Pray these things in Christ's name.